Are you going to violate our constitutional rights? We have a right to be here, to do what we're doing, to say what we're saying. It is my responsibility as a Muslim, and Allah will take care of me. Why is our government supporting a war that no one else supports? I can't be a coward, right, if my students are willing to risk all of this. Good afternoon, everyone. al salam alaikum. Uh, thank you so much to the Mo Muslim uh, Public Affairs Council for inviting me. I'm really privileged to be here with you today. Um, and I promised the organizers that the, my presentation would be 15 minutes. So when it hits 15 minutes, you're gonna hear some salsa music. Uh, and I'm going to step down. Um, but I wanna, um, well, let me start by saying this. We all know that Nihon uh, Hidanko, they just won the Nobel Peace Prize from Japan. When they learned that they won that prize, they said, Gaza looks like Japan 80 years ago. Um, so I do want to talk about what's going on in our campuses and our students and ourselves, our professors. But first, I want to say something at that and that it's completely impossible, it's absolutely absurd to talk about Islamophobia, about racism and discrimination against Muslims, about hate in Los Angeles, outside of linking that to the genocide that's taking place against Palestinians and especially against um, the U.S. sponsorship and complicity in that genocide. No matter how uncomfortable it makes people feel, and I'm not referring to those in here, but outside, um, uh, and we're on a campus right here that experienced traumatic events last spring. Um, the fact is, it's impossible to understand what's going on on our campuses uh, and discrimination and hatred against Muslims and Palestinians outside of two factors that come together with this toxic mix with devastating consequences. And the first is that US complicity um, uh, in this genocide. And this goes back all the way to post-World War II U.S. policy towards the Middle East, especially after 1967, with U.S. backing now for a half a century uh, of, um, is, uh, uh, of Israel and of Zionism as the entire cornerstone of U.S. policy towards the larger uh, Middle East, together with the backing of conservative uh, Middle Eastern regimes such as uh, Jordan, such as Egypt, such as Saudi Arabia, who are in fact repressing their own people who are protesting in solidarity with Palestine uh, at this time. Uh, so this is not just about Israeli genocide, but US sponsorship, participation, complicity, and sponsorship uh, in that uh, genocide. And it won't come to an end until there is mass pressure to bring that sponsorship uh, to an end. And that's why our campuses, what's going on in our campuses is so central part of the story here. Uh, that's the first. The second is that, and again, these are two factors that we we cannot separate from understanding hatred and discrimination against Muslims, against Arabs, and what's going on in Los Angeles. The second is the Zionist colonial project itself is grounded in anti-Palestinianism and anti-Arab hatred and Islamophobia. Um, it's Israel is a state literally founded on terrorism, on violent co colonial conquest and erasure of an entire uh, people. Genocide has been this ineluctable outcome to this project for 75 years, absent it being stopped. Um, that project has to legitimate itself through the dehumanization of Palestinians, of Arabs, and of Muslims. It has to foment fear, hatred, and aggression. That is how this whole project legitimates itself. It can only be constituted, this project of Zionism, through the creation of the other, the Arab, the Palestinian, uh, the, the Muslim, constructed as a dehumanized negation of Jewish identity. I'm a sociologist. We study these projects of domination and the need that they have to pursue identity formation in opposition to a constructed other. Um, so long as the US government procs up this project, objectively, objectively, it is fanning the, pl faint, uh, the flames of anti-Arab hatred, of anti-Muslim discrimination and hatred. And as the previous panelists already pointed out, it's no wonder that Bi Biden says that if there's no Israel, we would have to create one. It's no wonder that Biden says that he's a Zionist. Um, so you cannot say you are against Islamophobia, against anti-Arab hatred, and also sponsor Zionism and genocide. That is what we call a contradiction in terms. Uh, so think about this for a moment. Uh, 
We saw just a few weeks ago over the summer Netanyahu giving this speech before the, the U.S. Um, uh, the, the, the US uh, Congress. Uh, this is something I can't wrap my mind around. I, it's too profound to think about, too, shop, too shopping. A blood-soaked leader of a genocide getting dozens of standing ovations from the very halls of US power. It, it, it's something that cannot be normalized. Uh, but so why is this so important? It's because it's acceptable politically uh, it's politically correct in the dominant discourse to condemn Islamophobia, cond condemn anti-Arab discrimination here and in the halls of power in the United States. Yet it's forbidden to condemn what generates that anti-Palestinianism, that anti-Muslim hatred, which is the Zionist project and which is U.S. steadfast backing uh, for it. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say I'm against Islamophobia and against hate, but I'm okay with Israeli colonialism and apartheid with Zionism. If you're not willing to condemn US policy, US backing of genocide and of Zionism, you have no moral authority whatsoever to uh, condemn Islamophobia, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, or any other form of hate. You have, you're morally bankrupt. Uh, again, I know this is hard for some to hear. Again, maybe not in here, but outside. Um, I'm far removed from policymaking circles, so I can speak my mind, and I'm ethically bound, morally, uh, compulsion to speak my mind uh, here. Um, the so-called war on terror, the war on um, Muslims, this is so inculcated in our political culture, in our political system, in our daily thinking about the world, glorified in much Hollywood war pornography and Hollywood media, images of uh, Palestinians, of Arabs as crazed terrorists, inundates the whole cultural sphere and sets establishes mass sensibility and sets the stage for everything else. So I wanted to start with that and now turn to our uh, campuses. Those of us in academia, long before this genocide, long before the events of the last year, those of us who have spoken out on our campuses for Palestinian freedom to, and criticizing Israel, we've always been faced with this severe repression, this permanent campaign of silencing, the creation of this widespread atmosphere of fear and intimidation. In 2009, on my campus, UC Santa Barbara, I publicly denounced Operation Castlet, a massacre that led to thousands of deaths and, and injury and destruction in Gaza. For that, I was uh, investigation was opened against me. UC, the University of California, did everything it's co it could to fire me. It led to six months that investigation. Um, so the whole idea here is to create a, a chilling atmosphere of censorship and reprials. Those of us that speak out in favor of Palestinian freedom or um, against, uh, criticizes Israel or US policy uh, towards it, we're not hired. And if we are hired, then we're fired. And if we're going up for tenure, we're denied tenure. We're harassed, we're investigated. Spurious charges are brought up against both faculty and students. Students have been and continue to be suspended. Um, Palestinian Arab students come to our campuses in a, in a climate of fear. And this is, I've been a professor here at UC for 22 years now, and 23 years. This is not, this is not uh, new. But since October, we've seen a radical escalation of this. Unprecedented McCarthyite, um, unprecedented McCarthyite repression all across uh, the country, our constitutional rights, our right to free speech, our right to freedom of assembly, it's being completely stamp, uh, 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 tr uh, trampled under. Uh, it's, um, it's under siege. And the encampments were only one dimension uh, of this. More broadly, what we're seeing is the criminalization across the board on our campuses and also off our campuses of Palestine solidarity. Uh, the University of Maryland carried out, a, carried out a poll. This was November. This was about a month and a half into the, the genocide. And that poll found that 80% of faculty in all the U US university campuses were afraid to speak out against the genocide uh, or in favor of Palestinian freedom. Eight out of every 10 faculty members are scared because of this intimidation. Then just July 8th, that's two months ago, the Brookings Institute released another poll and found that more than 80% of scholars on the Middle East in all of the United States, 80% say, yeah, Israel's conducting genocide. They say, yeah, and this is the exact quote, yeah, there's anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab bigotry 
And that's a far bigger problem than anti-Semitism on our campuses, 80% said that. But quote, overwhelmingly they are afraid to express their views because of the consequences on campus. 79% in this poll conducted two and a half months ago say anti-Palestinian prejudice is prevalent. 73% say Islamophobia is prevalent on their campuses. 83% say they self-censor. Uh, in criticizing Israel because of fear of reprisals, reprisals and discipline by administrators or outside advocacy groups. This is an exact quote. Those advocacy, advocacy groups are the Israel uh, lobby and the apparatuses of state repression, whether it's our administrators and whether it's states, uh, states governments or federal uh, governments. Um, so I want to say something about this link this student, uh, what's going on our campuses with the unprecedented global intifada, which we're seeing in solidarity with Palestine. This struggle has been going on for decades, but it has reached an, an historic turning point. It took this genocide to reach this historic turning point. Um, October 9, um, which began the genocide, October 7 was the, was, we know those events, um, was a catalyst for something much bigger. It has touched a raw nerve and led to an unprecedented outcry worldwide. Uh, mass disaffection with the global status quo was already um, simmering this discontent and the genocide lit the fuse. Pa Gaza really is a potent symbol of the global fight crisis that we are experiencing right now, simply an unprecedented crisis. Uh, I wanna make an analytical point here uh, very quickly. I want to finish the presentation in my promised 15, 15 minutes. Um, so we have in sociology, again I'm in sociology, we have this concept of surplus humanity. What we see when we analyze the world in 2024 is that some two billion people at least, two billion out of 7.5 billion, we've become surplus humanity, meaning people just locked out and thrown away from the global economy, from global society, the powers that be have no use for two billion people. And there is no better example of what the system considers surplus humanity than Palestinians in Gaza. The last 10,000 work, Palestinian workers that went into Israel were sent back to Gaza for the powers that be for Israel, for the United States and the Middle East is no use whatsoever for the masses of Palestinian people in Gaza. Um, and so um, Palestinians are surplus humanity from the viewpoint of this system. Uh, those uh, images of unspeakable Israeli barbarity that we see, the suffering of the Gazans, that touched a chord in billions of people at the time of this crisis because it also holds up a mirror to us what the rest of the world is awaiting if this a genocide is not stopped. Everywhere we see that the fate of Palestine, therefore, is bound up with, the fate of all of humanity is bound up right now with the fate of Palestine. U.S. policy has been challenged um, by never before, by millions of people who have become aware of this issue, and the veil of silence has been lifted. Zionist hegemony is, in fact, cracking. The younger generation of Jews don't buy into the, into the, into the Zionist narrative. They have been in the forefront among our students and in the mass public, the young Jews and older Jews, at the forefront of the struggle against this uh, genocide. So Israel controls the military battlefield as we speak, but already has lost the battle for legitimacy. So in conclusion, um, I want to now say something about this unprecedented solidarity uh, with our universities as the epicenter and the unprecedented crackdown that it has brought about. We've seen the criminalization of Palestine solidarity. We've seen this McCarthyite crackdown on free speech, on academic freedom. Um, and the Uni U University of California, we're at UC, I work at a UC, spent, believe it or not, $29 million to counter the anti-genocide pro-Palestinian activism of students this past year. The Israel lobby is the most powerful political lobby in the United States. It's beyond the lobby. The gun lobby goes and they talk to legislators to try and not have guns restricted. This is something totally different. The Israel lobby is, 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 has integrated into our whole political and cultural system at every single level of society. Um, Politicians, journalists, academics, and scholars, even activists self-censor uh, out of fear. On Wednesday, this was just a few days ago, New York Jets football coach Robert Saleh was fired for wearing a Lebanese flag on his sweatshirt as he trained his football players. Um, so he's really, and I have... Uh, just about a minute or so, so I won't go into further detail, but we uncovered an Israeli secret covert operation coming from the highest levels of the Israeli state to repress 
the encampments and the student activism. And that secret covert operation is continuing at the highest level. Uh, it was exposed in some news outlet in Israel. The corporate media here ignored it. And then I published an article which was very widely circulated, exposing that this repression is coming from the highest levels of the Israeli state, uh, combined with from the US state um, itself. The US Congress has passed the Anti-Semitism um, Awareness Act, which as we know has this uh, absolutely outrageous conflation of anti-Semitism with, with uh, with um, anti-Zionism, uh, and that's the cornerstone with now it is planning to move into this new academic year that just began with a new level of intense uh, uh, um, re repression. Um, I'm just about out. I have about 15 seconds left. Um, but uh, so I, I want to um, just point out that there's a larger story here that maybe we'll get into into the discussion, and it's that... Um, it's that uh, there's a link here between the genocide going on against Palestine, the repression on and off our campuses, and a corporate lobby which is be making billions and billions in profit uh, from selling weapons and high tech and software that's used uh, for artificial intelligence to drop bombs on Gaza and now on Lebanon. And that corporate lobby which is profitably, profiting wildly from this genocide is fully integrated into our campuses and our universities. That's a story for UCLA right here. My campus, the leading military, industrial, and high-tech corporations that are selling and giving these weapons and the software to uh, Israel has made over the last 10 years billions of dollars in donations to University of California, Santa Barbara. So when the students are repressed, the administrators are doing the bidding of a larger power structure which is also behind this genocide. So I'll conclude with this uh, point. Um, as we've reached turn to our campuses. Um, there's new policies which are in place in which we're not allowed to have not only encampments, but temporary structures, amplified sound, chalking, freestanding signs, flyers, uh, outdoor displays, even tables, and we can't wear masks, and we have to report our identity to any university official that asks us to give us our identity. So the point here, as I conclude, is that the administrations of our campuses now want to return to normal. But there's no normality when genocide is taking place. Genocide is not normal. Um, <clears throat> This violence and hatred is not uh, normal. It's absolutely impossible. And me, myself, many of my colleagues, and our students commit ourselves to not letting this become normalized. Thank you. We're all going to go around and do quick introductions ourselves, and then um, we'll get started after that. So, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Talha Rafiq. I currently serve as the president of the MSU at USC. Today, I'll be moderating this panel, hopefully learning from some of the best in the field. Um, we're grateful to have two professors and two students um, here today, so it's going to be a diverse range of experiences that we'll be able to hear out. Um, Dr. William, if you want to introduce yourself first, even though, of course, you just made a, quite an introduction as well. Well, I'm William Robinson. I'm a professor of sociology, global international, and international studies at UC Santa Barbara. How you doing? I'm Rasul Miller. Salaam alaikum. I am a professor in the history department at UC Irvine. Salaam alaikum. My name is Rania Salem. I'm a second year law student at UCLA Law. Salaam alaikum. I'm Sanika Maloney, and I'm a second year law student at UCLA Law. So all four, and five, I guess, including myself, uh, of us have been um, obviously present on the campuses for the last four years. Some of us as students have been um, in regards to undergrad as well as um, postgrad. And um, so the conversation today really is about what's happening internally because a lot of our voice does get shut down. Um, we don't really get to promote much of the opinions that we do have. And obviously the professors might have their own experiences. So beginning with the first question, um, kind of the blanket statement question is, um, where do you currently feel yourself uh, you know, when it comes to basically presenting yourself on your campuses? Where do you feel limited? Where do you feel emboldened? Where can and can you not speak? How has that been on your particular campuses and maybe within your particular roles, whether as law students or, because I know both of you are law students, or um, you two as professors within the administration? I think that we definitely are limited. I would say last year I was the only Palestinian first year at UCLA Law, um, so definitely a struggle. Um, we wear our kofiyas every day, um, and that's the way that we try to represent. And I think that we're very limited in what we can say publicly because um, I think law students were some of the first people that were cracked down against. Um, for example, the SBA president, the student body um, president at NYU Law posted something um, very early in 
uh, in October last year, and they lost their um, their summer job, and that's what we basically rely on um, to enter the career once we graduate. And so I think they created a lot of, like they did a lot of fear mongering, and they created a space where law students particularly could not speak out. Um, so I think that there was a lot of fear mongering, and we do what we can, um, but there definitely is a limit to what you can say publicly. Um, we also have a lot of students that will dox you at our campus, and so um, you have to be careful about what you post on Instagram, for example. Um, there's a Palestinian guy at our school, he's a 3-0, that his Instagram posts were screenshotted and sent to his employer. Um, and so... You have to be careful, but I think that's the risk that people are willing to make, and so we still do what we can. Um, and I think, like, the chilling effect that it has is it becomes us about whether or not people think something is wrong and that they should say something and goes to the material, which is, is this worth losing my job over? Is it worth, like, me getting kicked out of school? And for a lot of people, like, they're going to make the decision that's going to you know, aid to the longevity of, of what they want to do. Um, and so the conversation, like, gradually shifted away from, like, what was actually happening to, like, people's, like, personal risk assessment. And I think that that was really harmful for a really long time. Um, all the way up until, I would say, Columbia started the encampments because it was the first time that students were like, oh, I don't care. Um, enough of us, at least. Yeah, um... Thank you for that. Thank you for your presentation, too. I really appreciated all your words. Um, uh, so I don't really have any fundamentally different analysis. I think uh, what you all lay out is exactly right. I'll just say that it does also extend to us as professors, you know. Um, <laughs> so I met UC Irvine and, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, we have students at Irvine who, who put it on the line and did a lot of good work. Um, and I was, I'm a junior professor black faculty, right, and I was one of the few, like, first professors that, you know, um, they asked to engage in some stuff, and so there was that, that level of conversation. I mean, I'm really fortunate because I had some, some, you know, senior faculty at Irvine who've been doing this work for a long time, and I could kind of come to them and say, okay, you know, how do we navigate this, you know, because um, I'm not trying to give these people an excuse, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, to not give me what they owe me. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have a moral responsibility and a responsibility to our students, right? Um, so I know for, from a faculty standpoint, it's also been interesting at my institution, UC Irvine, because we have a number of faculty that have been targeted and, and most of them or a significant number of them are black faculty, right? We have um, uh, a professor by the name of Tiffany Willoughby Harrard who you know was present at the protest and is a you know amazing resource for students, and you know she was uh, arrested for being a part of a peaceful protest, and you know and there were other faculty members who were also arrested, but the university has put extra charges on her, right? Really for no other reason than the fact that she's a black woman of, of, of a black woman, you know, um, who who is uh, astute enough that when a camera was put into her face as she was being arrested and people were asking her silly questions about, you know, what about your job? Her response was, what job do I have if our students don't have a future, right? Um, we have another faculty member, I won't say their name because, you know, it's, it's a more of internal thing, um, uh, but she was doxxed, basically, uh, because she took her students to the encampment. So these kind of things we're facing. And, you know, you see, to your point, just the virulent, you know, unabashed, unapologetic kind of, like many of us, if, and if you haven't been active in organizing and studying histories of social movements in America, might be surprised, right, to see the level of kind of just unabashed, just unfairness where, you know, we're going to target the people who are most vulnerable, right? Um, but what is heartening to me is that what I see is that the students' um, commitment in a lot of ways is actually helping to radicalize our faculty, right? Because when we see what you all are willing to do, right, it kind of makes us have a moment of, well, you know, I can't be a coward, right, <laughs> if my students are willing to risk all of this. And also, you know, a lot of people who don't understand the significance of, of you know, America's like horrendous foreign policy when it comes to Palestine, um, don't understand, I mean, it's been a year, so, you know, everybody knows now, right? But people who didn't necessarily have a really 
uh, sophisticated, I want, that's not the right word, people who didn't have an accurate analysis, an accurate understanding of what was happening, I think, among faculty, seeing students get violently arrested, brutalized, harassed for engaging in a principled, peaceful protest, I think is the thing that actually politicized folk. Whereas at least on my campus, you got professors talking about, you know, we need a union and how can we organize. So, um, you know, I know this isn't, this isn't really the answer to your question, but I think the students' commitment has, has created a ripple effect where now, you know, the universities have to contend with the fact that among students and faculty, there's a contingent of folks who aren't going to just take this line down. I learned something um, very quickly. Uh, so the most vulnerable um, among faculty is students who are all the students are vulnerable. The most vulnerable among faculty are those who don't have tenure and those faculty from certain uh, from people faculty of color. So the tenured faculty, we thought we were the most protected. The last year, I'm sure we can count literally hundreds of cases where untenured faculty have one or another way been sanctioned or simply uh, fired, or adjunct faculty is not hired again. But last month, there was the first case in the United States, you may remember her name, a professor, fully tenured professor of a university in Pennsylvania who was fired, Jewish American, fired for being anti-Semitic because she spoke out and mentioned Palestine and sending, sending critically about Israel. So that is sending a powerful message. That is intentionally sending a powerful message and it got garnered enormous media uh, publicity that even tenured faculty is not protected. But I just want to say we... Our defense is in numbers, right. our de and that's what they want to do. They want to break down the numbers and isolate individuals that again can be used as examples of repression and scare us from, from our numbers. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to my second question, um, which is how does one, whether a professor or a student, evaluate, or how have you evaluated the level at which risks are even available to take? Because one thing I think is like a lot of individuals might feel like, if I put this on the line, Things that I, you know, law school is not easy to get into, let's just say that, let alone UCLA law school. So obviously there's a level of like um, self that you're almost giving up. That's like, there's things that, are, that might happen that you have no control over. So it's a bit more of a subjective answer and subjective take, but I think that's important today, especially as we talked a lot about things objectively. But when it comes to the human limit, like what has been like kind of the evaluation system that professors have used in comparison to the way students have used? Because um, I know there's not that much dialogue sometimes between students and professors, but like you said, professors get emboldened almost when they see their own students, the people that they signed, this, you guys signed on to this job for the students, and now these are the same students that are getting taken away in cuffs, right? So what are the kind of evaluation systems that you're using, and what are some misconceptions of that evaluation system? Like, I know that, for example, doxing, right, um, happened numerous times last year, last semester, and without fail, people came up to me, uh, admissions counselors from different schools, and they were like, yeah, we don't really care. Like, surprisingly, we don't care that much. Like, there's a limit, obviously, but it was, it was a misconception that if you get like put on the internet by Canary Mission or some other organization, everything was gone. So I guess what is the kind of evaluation system and the kind of uh, uh, mentality that you as professors and students have had going into doing advocacy work, whether it be protesting or whether it be sitting on panels, et cetera, et cetera, going down that line? I feel like I can answer at least that part because I have been doxxed and like arrested before going to law school uh, during 2020. And for a long time, I actually put off going to law school and applying for law school out of fear that I wouldn't get in because of it. And like, it is like, it's a, it has more ideological value than it actually does in like real value of like scaring people. And so a lot of times like, it's like a paper tiger effect where as long as you're intimidated by it, it works. Um, and I, I think since we're all here for impact, like, you know, a law gives people different challenges based on what they can handle and what they can lose. So, like, if you're being given a challenge, like, you need to, like, really look inside and evaluate what, whether you've been given that challenge for a reason and, like, what, you're, what you need to do to overcome it. And I think for people who are risk averse for different reasons, I understand it. But I guess it's, like, what are you avoiding the risk in preservation of is it in like a selfish end? Is it in a myopic end, which is like, I just really want this specific job, which mind you, a job that is not guaranteed in the market, which is not doing good. Um, so like, how would you feel if you did all this, you let all this uh, like genocide continue, you didn't say anything for a job that you don't even end up getting? Like, 
and that's going to be a case that happens again and again. So, like, what are you avoiding the risk in service of? Like, should I get arrested again? Probably not, right? But that's not me doing it in avoidance of saying something. It's me doing it in avoidance of limiting the opportunities for me to then organize in different spaces. So are you going to take steps back based on reevaluating and being strategic about when you're going to hit harder? Like when, when you get a chance to actually make your, your stand or are you doing it in like a selfish, like, and, and also like a fear driven manner? Because honestly, like jobs matter, stability matters, but also like, there, there's other things you can do. Like sometimes you get so pigeonholed on like a plan that you have for life and maybe that repression that you get puts you on a different path. Like I don't think I would have had a compelling reason to go to law school if I didn't get arrested. I don't think I would have had like the same life in general if I didn't face some of the repression that I faced and it changed me in a better way. And I'm not saying repression is good, but I'm saying sometimes we get put through things that we can actually bounce back from, and if not, it projects us to an even higher status in life in a, in a way that's spiritually fulfilling, maybe not monetarily fulfilling. And before we continue, I want to add what we're fighting, and this is the student in me as well, so this is not the moderator in me, but is, um, you know, we're asking for free speech, right? The reason why LA versus hate is a part of this conversation today as well is because it's just a matter of speaking our truth. Like, it's not a matter of, like, we're not trying to do something absurd. We're not trying to take USC or UCLA down. Like, calm your horses. You don't need $30 million in uh, new weaponry for students for that. We're asking, can we talk on campus? And can we actually have a, a productive conversation and open up a dialogue and opinion? So it's like, I completely, you know, even what you said um, invigorates me too because I'm, I'm remembering what exactly am I even fighting for? It's the bare minimum. Like, it's not something drastic um, above that. And we get, kind of get spinned in that way sometimes. And if that's worth getting docs for, then it's worth getting docs for. Like, it, that's just a matter of like being human in America as well. So um, yeah, Bristol, uh, you were about to continue. Yeah, I mean, so many things to say. For one, I'll say, you know, at a certain point, <laughs> you, you know, among, among academics, we always hear, you know, or well, at least I got the advice, you know, don't do this or that till you get tenure. Right? Don't do this till you get tenure. Don't get, get tenure. Get that secure job, right? And then a lot of folks get tenure and they still don't say a damn thing, right? So, excuse me for cussing. But, you know, so it, it kind of shows you that there's a disciplining going on, right? Where if you say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to cross this line, I'm not going to do that, you know, you get used to doing that, right? And to the agree that these institutions can be successful in disciplining us all in this way, they don't have to worry about us ever, you know, really doing anything that will change anything. Um, on the other hand, to your point, you know, our strength is in our numbers. I have a friend who um, is, uh, and it's kind of a high profile case, well, I have a friend who's, um, you know, uh, Cornell University tried to, you know, basically uh, dismiss this cat and, uh, and, and um, deport him and everything. And they picked the wrong one because he understands that we have strength in numbers and, you know, he's just the type of person who has no problem going on every, you know, talk show and uh, in media and he understands organizing, right? Um, once we understand that, you know, the power and the protection comes not in not crossing a certain line so that we don't intimidate certain forces that, you know, we're trying to actually pressure, it comes from us actually being able to be organized and have strength in our numbers, you know, then we can begin to protect one another, right? That's where the protection will come. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> but yeah. Y'all don't have to clap. <laughs> well, ditto to what my fellow panelists has said, and I'll add one thing. Uh, the, our administrators, and again, behind them is a larger power structure, which involves those that are profiting from and sponsoring this genocide uh, and U.S. policy more generally towards the Middle East. But from, from the start of this intifada of, pa of, of, of solidarity with Palestine in October up through the end of spring, our administrators had a problem. And the problem was we were exercising our constitutional right to free speech and freedom of assembly. And when they repressed us, that's what we responded back. Are you going to violate our constitutional rights? We have a right to be here to do what we're doing, to say what we're saying. So 
the administrators and those larger powers that be had to figure out over the summer, what do we do to counter that? And they came up with it. Congress passed the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, and so now it is illegal to criticize Zionism and Israel because they say that's anti-Semitism. And the US Constitution says you can't discriminate by supposedly by ethnicity, race, or uh, religion, et cetera. Um, and so now they have a legal weapon to use against us going into this new um, uh, academic year. And that's really important, and uh, that, is, that is really dangerous. I want to, I want to point that out. Yeah, and just to add on to that, to build onto that, um, you know, the UCs have responded accordingly now with a whole list of things that now you can't do. Like you can't, you know, you can't cover your face, right? And, with, and COVID is not over, right? You can't, uh, you know, you have to identify yourself. You can't use amplified sound. You can't, you know, uh, have an encampment. And I mean, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, right? But for anybody who's not convinced that this is a problem, right, it will inevitably be used for a bunch of other stuff. Like the next time students or faculty decide to have a strike, all of these things are gonna be galvanized to make sure, like one of the things that they've meted out, I'm not sure if this is UC wide, it probably is, but certainly at UC Irvine, they've like made it explicit now, you can't, us as faculty members, we can't cancel our class, right, to align with a demonstration or something like that, right? Now, if our graduate students or our students or, or other faculty go on strike, they will use that to say you cannot cancel class to withhold your labor in solidarity of a strike. So there's all of these other layers, like this opens up a space to basically, you know, repress any kind of, you know, organizing or activism. So it's, um, it's not looking good for the home team. <laughs> no, but we're, we're fighting back. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, Rania, oh. I know you want to say something. Well, I was just going to speak about personal um, risk assessment. I think especially as as Muslims, like, n there's no one you're supposed to fear but Allah. And so I think that, like, just putting your trust in God and, like, just having this, like, deep faith that, like, you'll end up exactly where you belong and, every like, this is all a part of God's plan, I think, really helped me in the last year. And I think that, um, like, even yesterday for Jema, the... They um, they let a Palestinian student do the khutbah, and he talked about our our duty as Muslimin to stand for justice and to speak out. And I think that that's a big thing for me as well. Is that like at the end of the day, this is my responsibility as a Muslim, and Allah will take care of me, and um, I'll be okay at the end of the day. And whatever repression I face here is nothing compared to those on the ground are facing. And so, just keeping that in mind, I think it's very grounding and helps me when it comes to risk assessment because. Losing your job is nothing compared to getting bombs dropped on you. So, uh, you know, I want to add um, one thing about the mechanism they're using now. Title VI, if you're not familiar with that, the federal government supplies um, hundreds of millions of dollars in funding to public education, K through 12, and then our universities. And the law, Title VI, says that if any university is condoning or engaging in racial or ethnic discrimination, religious, racial and ethnic discrimination, uh, they don't get those funds. And so once the US federal government has made criminal um, critiquing Zionism uh, and critiquing Israel, then they cut off the funding. And that puts pressures on the administrators. Even when you're a good administrator, you don't want to repress the students and the faculty. You now have this hanging over you that the corporations will suspend their funding and that the federal government will suspend uh, their funding. So even if you're a good administrator, you, you have a choice. You either fight back against this, and you know the, the State Department official that resigned, nothing but incredible respect for his stand. Um, so, but the administrators now have that choice. They either fight back against this, or they just shut their mouths and enjoy their career and you know, um, don't speak out against genocide. Amazing. Um, so that brings me to the next question, which is kind of what's worked and what hasn't worked on the campuses. Um, you can obviously relate to your campuses a little bit more because you're in very different situations when we're talking about like USC, UCLA, UC Irvine, and UCSB. But um, particularly from the standpoint of um, obviously students have been mobilizing way more than um, maybe professors have, but professors might be doing more work behind the scenes when it comes to like all those board meetings that happen. And they're always like, you know, getting roped into that with the, the presidents and the provosts of each school. So um, kind of around what has worked, what hasn't worked, and if anyone is involved in a school system, how they can contribute, or if anyone is not involved in the school system, any methods or methodologies you have seen that could be contributed. Um, where it could be related to like public demonstrations or it could be related to like 
financial incentives or it could be anything right. else. Like what, what is kind of the perception that people should have when they're looking at schools and how to make impact in those schools? What, okay, so that question other people here can probably answer a little bit better, but I'd want to zoom out and just offer this perspective. When we say what has worked and what hasn't worked, I mean, Palestine isn't free yet, so we don't know what's going to work here, but we can have an historical perspective and see what worked, you know, to, to when students were organizing around uh, black folks having, I don't, you know, around black folks having a space in the university, when students were war organizing in the sit-in movement, when students were organizing around Vietnam, and when people were organizing around South Africa, right? And what we see that works is direct action, public pressure. What doesn't work is capitulation, right? <laughs> what doesn't work is, okay, let's try to make some gradual, you know, policy change. This, that, this never worked, right? What works is when people in the South Africa movement, free South Africa movement, people did things like taking over buildings, right? Getting arrested, right? What works is when you have enough people that are willing to, say again, boycotts, absolutely, absolutely, right? In fact, I mean, you know, we know that like the boycott divest sanction movement bars directly from the free South Africa movement. There's a reason for that, right? Um, I'm shy to talk too much about the free South Africa movement when you're sitting right here, but um, you know, so I think what we, what we know that works is pressure. Right, that's, that's the big takeaway. Now, we could talk about the specifics of you know, what avenue we should take, what strategy, but the only way this will get done is if it's clear that there are enough people who are willing to lay it on the line, whether that's their job or whether that's their life, right? I had a conversation with, with my advisor who was very involved in the Free South Africa movement. She pointed something out that was very you know, interesting to me. She said when we were organizing around Vietnam, elected officials wanted to call police authorities in to repress students, and administrators were saying, no, please don't, right? They were trying to be a barrier, right? Now we have administrators calling the police on their students, right? The only way you're going to be able to break that level of repression is with, you know, strong commitment, strong solidarity, and thankfully we see, you know, there is a groundswell of support. Like, at the end of the day, if nothing else, the, the sort of ideological consensus in favor, in favor of Zionism has been broken, right? But what does, you know, what does a beast do when it's cornered? It fights harder, right? But that also is a sign that something that people are doing is working. I agree with the last point a lot because, I, and I think we have to be generative and forward facing too, is like, if you don't analyze the student movements of the past and also analyze what they didn't do or what they didn't account for, which like, especially in like the age of like social media and increased like surveillance, like what does that look like? But we have to innovate and we have to be constantly trying new things. And if there's something that we haven't tried or you haven't tried that you're scared to try, it probably does work. You just are scared to try it. Um, but I also think that um, part of the issue is one of like methodology. And as much as I, I like organizations that are explicitly for solidarity, they can't just exist in a vacuum. And like they also have to like kind of contextualize themselves. Like we know that SJP is not going to liberate Palestine, right? It's like the bottom rung, you know, like recruit level, like of this, not that, but that doesn't mean it's less valuable. It just means like, there's like a chain of like command of like, how do we, how do we contextualize what we can do and how does that align with like the most effective currents globally that are putting pressure like at the right time? Because like we can all run at a brick wall, like one by one at different times with the same energy, but if you're not doing it at the same time, coordinated, strategy, like the strategy is not there, then you're not gonna knock it down. Um, and I think the other part is you have to, we have to rethink like the solidarity economy because we live in like the second or first largest economy in the world, depending on who you ask. And we're still unable to create infrastructure, get aid in, um, and I know the number of evacuations is dwindling, but, and I'll see stories of like these like Mauritanian like tribal leaders who did like a campaign, it's like tighten the belt for Palestine, and they were able, able to raise millions, but they weren't just giving them straight to like humanitarian NGOs or like these like nebulous like um, international organizations, they gave it to governments in Palestine directly, and so like 
our solidarity economy is is different now because with the South African movement, you were able to just give money to the ANC. Obviously, we can't do that, but we have to ask ourselves like, what does our contribution look like that isn't just something that's already being done at the UN level? Like, are we making many UNs here where we're humanitarian in our posture? Or are we actually being generative in, in what solidarity we can offer? And, like solutions that we're looking for, uh, which depend on what, you know, what you're doing. But I also think that you have to make these bridges to like the communities that you exist in because the average person who works, who is not Muslim, who is not Arab, probably knows something about what's going on right now. And they might have opinions, and they're probably largely not well informed, but they have a hard time linking what is happening in Palestine to what's happening to them on a daily basis. And I don't wanna rely on like the individual like moral capacity of like every single American ever, right? Like that sounds like a losing game, but the winning game is finding ways to link the fact that most of us do not want more money going to Israel, and most of us don't really support this genocidal war. And then you have to extrapolate the answer from there, which is why is our government supporting a war that no one else supports? Because even going back to the war on Iraq, there was like actual Muslim American support for the war on Iraq, which like, you know, obviously for really interesting reasons, but at least th there was buy-in on that, right? There's zero buy-in right now, and there's like this repression, there's digging in, and you have to ask, like, why is our government able to function with or without our consent, right? So part of the issue is people think that the methodology is we're freeing Palestine, which is not true. The, the problem is Palestine is freeing itself. We are not freeing ourselves from an oppressive American regime that is exporting itself onto the Palestinian people, and we have no say in whether that happens or not. We are not free, and if we don't do something about it, that's a stain on our moral consciousness and also a limitation to our futures and realities as like Americans. Well, yeah, I was just quickly going to say, and I think that Cindy can, um, Crystal already brought it up, that we are not going to free Palestine here. We're not going to do it at L.A., not at UCLA. And I think that just remembering that those on the ground will free themselves. And uh, Palestine has its own freedom fighters, and we're not doing that work. In terms of what has worked and what hasn't worked, I think that people, we need to continue organizing and getting organized. Um, I think that the Muslim community is lacks um, in uh, being organized. Um, but that's something that we could definitely work on, and I think that that helps. Um, I think that, again, I think the encampments did help radicalize a lot of people, and before that, like, we had faculty that told us, like, we support you, we're here, we're allies, and when it came to it, like, they didn't do anything until the encampments hit. And so, like, sometimes um, they need... It sucks that it needed to get to that level for people to do something about it, but when it came down to it, we ha did have our faculty like at the jails, doing jail support, doing all the legal work behind the scenes, and so I think that, um, yeah, I, it took a lot of that, but <laughs> I would say overall, I think getting organized is highly important, but also recognizing your role in the movement and that we're not freeing Palestine and they'll free themselves. I'll um, add, uh, zoom out a little bit here and add, um, remember that the darkest moment is right before dawn. And we really have gone through a turning point. It doesn't seem like that now in the midst of all of this repression, but things are very different now than they were uh, before October of last year. And maybe we can say that sure, it took Algeria 150 years to achieve its independence. It's not gonna take Palestine, uh, that at all, but um, there's really three fronts of battle if we look worldwide for the for Palestinian freedom. And the, obviously the first is Palestinian resistance. Every single breath that any Palestinian takes to resist is the very first line of battle. The second is a whole worldwide community and the whole world is up in arms. It's governments that haven't done anything, but everywhere you go in the, in the world. But for us specifically in the United States, I'd say that our First, our responsibility here is to radically 
change U.S. policy. We've all spoken about that today. Uh, and that involves also some long, hard work of changing mass public opinion to build up pressure on U.S. state for a change in policy. And we have had a turning point in the last year. It's just like uh, uh, Russell said, it's a wild beast which is now um, cornered. Um, so that's, that's our job. And I just want to go, the reason I mentioned Al Algeria is that the Algerian resistance is what boomeranged back to change public opinion inside France. And once there was mass public opinion and pressure inside France for the French to withdraw, that heightened in combination with Algerian resistance that led to Algerian independence. Obviously, there's no direct parallel here, but there's sort of an, an analogy that I want to point out. That's our front of struggle, to radically change US policy. And if I can just add one more upside. Yes. <laughs> And if I could add one more thing before we move to the next question, and this was a conversation that we had a lot with our students, um, at least at Irvine. Um, so then, if that's the front of struggle for us here in the states, what's the front of struggle for folks actually in the university? And and I and I don't and I I don't want to present my thoughts on that as the the beginning or end of that, but to my mind, it's divestment, right? Um, and how do you achieve divestment? I think it's probably going to come through some work stoppages, right? So that's where I think we should be thinking yeah. about how do we coordinate and how do we organize to protect ourselves preemptively when that time comes. If you want to elaborate on it, actually, because UCI was one of the only well, one of the only schools and one of the first ones to actually get somewhere with like divestment talks. Um, Did we get somewhere? <laughs> it got more than USC, I'll tell you that. Um, Fair enough. So, <laughs> like, um, what kind of happened there? Like, I think what happened was around, I think, Man, okay, I don't want to, it's a lot. So, but one of the, the things that we benefited from at Irvine was how horrible the university's response here was. Um, so nobody wanted to replicate that, right? I'm sure I'm not an administrator. I'm not in touch with no administrators, but I'm sure there were conversations about we don't want to look like that, right? Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, so that was happening. And then also there was, there was a lot of, you know, pressure coming from the students. And I mean, it was a lot of little things. We had, we had a, a mayor uh, named Farrah Khan, right? So Farrah Khan protected the students. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I'm not, you know, you could, I, I think all elected officials are a mixed bag. But, but on the day when the encampment started and there were administrators who wanted to just, you know, do something similar to what had happened the night before at uh, UCLA. I think it was the night before. I might be getting my dates off at this point, the chronology off. But, you know, the mayor stepped in and said, you know, no, we're not going to, you know, allow that to happen. Um, I believe the mayor was out of town. Yeah, you can clap for that, right? <laughs> I think the mayor was out of town the day that they actually did call in, uh, the, the 20 different police forces <laughs> on campus to, you know, shut down the encampment. Um, but... I'm saying all that to say, you know, there were factors there that I think, and there was a lot of community support, right? The community, predominantly the Muslim, Arab, South Asian, you know, Muslim community came out to support the, the, the students um, at Irvine, and I think that helped a lot. Um, you know, because it, at, at all of these encampments, or many of these encampments, you know, you also have that element of kind of like, you know, right wing, white supremacist vigilante, Violence is always looming, right? But when you have like a, a nice, solid, you know, showing of community support of folks who are like, we're not going to let you do this, you know, to our, you know, nieces and nephews and, you know, younger brothers and sisters, you know, I think that that was helpful. So, you know, I say all that to say, I mean, there were things that worked in our favor, but ultimately, you know, UC Irvine didn't, didn't divest anything, didn't really look into divesting anything. It didn't negotiate in good faith in any way, right? Literally, there was a negotiation happening, and in the middle of the negotiation, they like suspended all students who were there to negotiate. So can't give Irvine any credit. Um, but I, I think, again, a lot of us as faculty beginning to organize across the UC systems understand, understood and understand, one, that this is a UC-wide issue, so it's going to take um, organizing across the UCs, not just kind of every campus doing it in a silo. And two, it, this is a fight that's going to have to involve not just undergraduate students or even undergraduate and grad students, but professors, faculty are going to have to play a big role in achieving this specific goal, which is not the liberation of Palestine, right? But it's at least 
the hopefully the removal of a significant amount of financial support from the universities that we work at work at for Zionism and and you know the repression of, of Palestinian people in this genocide, and also hopefully the decoupling of some of our intellectual institutions with the Zionist regime. Um, you know, UC Riverside had a, a very um, revealing experience. The, the students set up a, a, an encampment, and then the chancellor met with them, you remember this, and said, okay, we're gonna divest. So the students, everyone applauded, you know, we all got our, in our social media, we were so happy. Um, and then literally the next day, the chancellor sent a, so, uh, in, in a um, social, what do you call it? Social, social, media. Uh, social media message to the multi-million dollar donors to UCR and said, don't worry about that. That was just like a public relations. Don't worry about that. We're not divesting. And that was, remember, we captured that and sent it around. Um, so that we have to remember what happened there um, because the students dismantled their encampments as soon as they, you know, the chancellor had told them that. Uh, but really, this is a key point. Our, on our campus, I think it was UC wide, the graduate students in conjunction with the encampments went on strike. Mm -hmm. And, and a, unfortunately the STEM students, they're too integrated, they get paid by military corporations and the high tech corporations. But a lot of them in the social sciences and humanities, all of our graduate students went on strike. which is about 30, 40% of the students on campus. The faculty did not go on strike. Mm -hmm. um, and the undergraduates supported the graduate students. Right? They didn't complain that they weren't getting graded and so forth, because graduate students do all that work. Um, but the faculty lagged behind. Um, and then, so what happened is those graduate students became very vulnerable, and they were notified that the time they were on strike, they weren't going to get paid. Mm -hmm. When they didn't go back to work, they would, be, they would lose their employment with the university. Um, so again, I mean, we're in this battle with so many multiple dimensions, so many multiple fronts of struggle. But yeah, we faculty um, have to get much more on board. Yeah. That I think that it's important to recognize that our goal is divestment, and I think that UCR's uh, celebration was a little bit premature, and I think that we need to know what divestment actually looks like. Um, and I think that creating a committee or promising to divest is not real divestment, and so I think that a lot of universities are like, our school divested, and that's not actually the case, and so being very clear about what your goal is and what that actually looks like is really important. Um, so we're kind of over time already. So I will let anyone else, if they want to add any like final comments or thoughts, whether from a student's perspective, and also like removing, I think the conversation about removing this like mentality of self from the conversation, like we're really just this kind of small piece in the entire, like what's going on. So it's like, if you have any final comments related to that or related to like actions, items and stuff when it comes to campuses, uh, feel free to like drop anything. Cause I could go another, another question, but that would take us to the, probably the end of the booking of this room. So um, I don't want to do that, obviously. I think the only thing worth adding is like, this is a tension of like ownership, um, like ownership over your work as maybe a professor, ownership over your tuition money as a student, ownership over your community and ownership over a government that purports to be leading with your consent. Um, and I recently went to Cuba this summer and I met Palestinian students who go to the medical school in Cuba for free, uh, which we all know Cuba does not have a lot of money. <laughs> um, and because of America. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, I remember we asked the Cuban students, like, or the Gazan students in Cuba, what they experienced at their school. And they said, they felt like they were a class above the rest of the other students. Like they were special, honored guests of the university. Um, that anytime someone said something even remotely Zionist, like the school would do the exact opposite thing that happened at Riverside, which is, don't worry about them. You know, we got you. Like, and it's so like you can flip the reality of like what a school could be doing. Like, I, I think about realities where like I'm maybe somewhere that's not America and like, my school takes students to continue their education if they have to evacuate Gaza, or my school commits to sending teachers when the reconstruction of, of Gaza and like parts of the West Bank happens. Like you have to think about like what, what the reality is that you want and, and understand like why why it's not the case. And the case is you simply do not own anything 
we don't own anything. And until you own something, you cannot help people with like these empty hands and, and platitudes and like moral solidarity and verbal solidarity is great, but seizing ownership of the things that we've produced with our own hands and, and this government that, again, relies on our tax dollars to support itself and, um, and, and these corporations that use our labor, like we have to take ownership and then use that ownership to reflect the sentiments morally that, that we want to see in the world. Yeah, I just want to close off by, again, what you said was like um, removing yourself out of this. And I think that something I had to confront was like, this is not about me as a Palestinian living in the U.S. It's it's bigger than me. And uh, I think that a lot of people need to recognize that it's not a student movement. It's not about us as students. We stand for something bigger than ourselves. And I think the last point I want to end off on is like... Um, I think that especially like post 9-11, a lot of Muslims are scared of looking like the terrorists or looking whatever. Like we were obviously villainized and demonized and people are still shying away from being advocates or speaking up because of that. And I'm just so ready for us to let that go. And I'm tired of us like we internalize the fear mongering and we repeat it. And I think that it's just so frustrating and I can't wait till like Muslims get over that. And it's just like whatever they call us terrorists, whatever the case may be, I think we need to just get over that and... Uh, again, remember that there's no one, no one to fear but Allah, and Allah will protect us. And um, so, yeah, that'll, that's what I'll end off on. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is, alhamdulillah, for, for our uh, young folks who don't really remember post 9 11 that well, because they're not operating out of fear. And so, we all need to take a page from the, the book of you know, that uh, contingent of our communities. I'll just end by saying, it looks like it it looks like we're on the defensive it looks like we're we're losing but it's not the case it's really not the case we have a long battle ahead of us yes um but i want to read you a quote from mossad um and the quote is scary but the quote is because israel it's the zionist project and his backers are backed into the corner mossad sent us tweet to all the students, all of you guys, in the encampments and throughout the United States. And it was very public. They sent this tweet and they announced it publicly. It's just the actual quote from the tweet in the midst of the encampments. Facial recognition can determine whether you participated in pro-Hamas protests at universities. Your jobs and your degrees will be worthless. Your hiring opportunities will be limited. That came from Mossad and they publicly proclaimed that. So it looks like They've got us cornered, but it's the reverse. It's the wild beast trying to lash out back at being cornered. So we want to remember, just once again, I'll conclude by saying the darkest moment is right before dawn. If, if all of us protest, they got to give somebody a job, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I will add also, not a single student cared about that statement because um, to us, yeah. like, again, the fear, I think a lot of the adults in the room, the parents, let your kids go, trust me. Right. Like, That's the right. fear might have existed right. before, but I grew up in a generation that, you know, I knew 9-11 happened, but I didn't leave a fear out of it, you know? And that's because adults in our community had gotten us to a point where we were like, we didn't feel scared of it. So we're, not saying we're a step ahead, but we're a step ahead. Like, trust our step, and then, like, that can come from that too. And last but not least, I'll end on saying this. Um, Noah's Ark, or Prophet Noah, for the Muslims in the room, and non-Muslims, Noah's Ark. The entire story of that is what? No one followed the Prophet. Not a single individual followed the prophet, but he still did what was right, and God took care of him. So in a lot of ways, this whole thing, like, there's like 30 of us in this room. The prophet had no one, and that was a prophet of God. So we're not alone. We're not, we're not, we're not fighting alone, and the people of Gaza, like, they're fighting together as well, and all it takes, like you said, is a little bit of time. Thank you guys, again, for being on this panel, and we appreciate you all.